meeting of the Community Preservation Committee being held in the Don B. Griffin Room, Howitch Town Hall, 732 Main Street, Howitch, on, at 6 o'clock on Thursday, December 15th. Um, the usual taping notification, anybody who would like to tape this particular meeting, please inform the chair. Um, any public comment? Hearing none, oh, yes, there is a public comment. <laughs> please, identify, please identify yourself. Kathy Green. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to give everybody an update on the um, Spruce Woods project. Uh, HCT received formal pledge from Department of Conservation and Recreation for 500000 which is going to complete their $3 million fundraising project. So the project is complete with the town's assistance. We all know we got the 400000 land grant, which will be a reimbursement when this closes in June. That's excellent. Any questions from the Benny board member? No, I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, moving on. Um, approval of the minutes of CPC minutes, December 8, 2022. I move to accept the minutes of December 8, 2022. Motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion. Oh, approved. Both at the same time. Just pick one. Flip a coin. <laughs> okay. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll abstain. I was second. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, new and the new business discussion with the town health director, Kathleen O'Neill. Good evening. Welcome. Katie O'Neill, health director. How are you? Uh, <laughs> We're doing well for the moment. <laughs> Good. Um, the reason I asked you here at this meeting tonight is um, I'm kind of confused over a couple of the projects we have in the books, and they're from recreation, and it has to do with the septic systems. Um, if I don't know how that to categorize it, but if we put if if the board votes for the septic systems to be placed. Does the state legislature or does the county have an ability to change what we have proposed? The county does not. The state does have the ability to change. At this point, I can say Harwich already has the sewer project in place. I would not base your decision, decision based solely on the DEP. Um, I have already approved that plan. I recommend the approval of the plan. Um, I know there was some discussion of IA. I would approve the plan as, as provided. Um, and it would ultimately be the Board of Health's decision whether it would need IA or not. Board of Health of the Town of Howitch. Correct. Okay. Who, who does take its um, state regulations from the DEP. Okay. That clarifies a lot. Um, anything from any of the board members? I. John. Just to follow up, I thought that one of the sources of doubts that was brought up when this came up was a concern that whatever the Harwich Health Department or Board of Health decides now could be overridden, say, in a year, and, uh, and uh, that would uh, incur an additional expense in, in the development of the septic system. Because a year from now, the state says, no, you have to do something different. Do you have anything to say about that possibility? If, if I had a crystal ball, I would be a millionaire right now. So un unfortunately, <laughs> I wish too. I could give you a set answer. Um, there are draft regulations that are out right now. Um, I know the town of Harwich, is, as well as other towns on Cape, have submitted comments. So hopefully, amendments will be made to those. Um, we don't know. The state can do anything they want, in theory. 
um, that applies to any regulation they have. If they want to amend it in a year, we don't necessarily have control over that. Um, I would not anticipate that the pond restroom would be impacted by the change, but again, I, I don't know what a year holds, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Perfect. For All clarifying. Right. Absolutely. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Mr. Administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Okay, so um, we're in now, we're in the discussion of CH2, the Howitch Affordable Trust Funds. <coughs> um, the amount of requested is $500,000. Sir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I will tell you that there is some slight modifications to the application information without necessarily uh, changing the application, and that is to say, um, under project manager, uh, you see my name there as the town administrator and the chair. Um, going forward, however, uh, I would be the applicant <coughs> as the chair of the trust, but the project manager will be our newly appointed and uh, onboard housing advocate, uh, Ms. Brianna Nickerson. And so for what it's worth, um, I'll be relying upon Brianna to assist me in all matters in housing. Um, as chair of the trust, I am restricted to affordable housing, capital A, capital H. As our housing advocate, she is uh, under no restrictions. And then I don't know if it got cut off on my PDF, but under project description, um, what I would add just after the word housing uh, would be the phrase, in support of the purpose of the trust. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to the board for questions. We'll start with Mary. So I guess my question is, um, what funds do you still have left from prior years in total? Because I don't so, have that number. So I do not have uh, an updated uh, right. balance sheet yet. Um, and that's out of respect for our finance director who's still uh, helping us get through tax classification. I believe the last one I presented to you folks is the last one we have on record. Okay. Um, but if I had to hazard a guess, I believe we're hovering around 1.1 million. All right. um, I think what might be a more relevant factor is uh, the trust has not yet um, gone through the process of asking the Board of Selectmen for cell tower revenue. So we would be adding those to our coffers. Understood. So the 5,000, the 500,000 is like we've asked every year to just keep building the coffers so that money is exactly. available yep. to be able to jump on a project when something becomes available. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Elizabeth. <laughs> um, I have nothing to say at this point. Thank you. Okay. Carol. Um, I'm fine. Thank you. John. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm just curious whether you can say anything about anything you have in the pipeline that might have. I mean, is there stuff? in the pipeline that might have a, a, uh, a significant impact on that approximately $1.1 million balance. Um, I certainly do, and I would say it's from the uh, perspective of uh, the hiring of J.M. Goldson, uh, or the rehiring, although from my perspective it's, it's a brand new start. Uh, J.M. Goldson, as you may know, was under contract with the trust uh, excuse me, the Board of Trustees back in, um, I think it was uh, early 2019, uh, Ms. Gouldson's firm was hired to assist the Board of Trustees in developing their action plan. Of course, at that time, uh, the Board of Trustees and the trust fund was a little over a year old. Um, Ms. Gouldson's firm, um, I think it was by mutual agreement from what I recall, uh, under a previous chair, it was agreed that during COVID, they weren't able to do their work, and so the contract was negated, and they, they stopped that. Uh, given that we're now past um, the majority of restrictions of uh, COVID-19, and I'm going back, I believe, the spring of this year, uh, the Board of Trustees voted to do a, uh, have the town do an RFP, and we did, and that's for the purpose of reestablishing a process 
to create an action plan. And so the action plan is meant to guide the Board of Trustees on how we should be operating generally. Um, again, I'll put it out there because it's easy for me to do so, having not uh, joined uh, the trust uh, until after that original effort. You know, we can um, Monday morning quarterback about any actions the trust has taken thus far, but I still think it's a proper thing for us to avail ourselves of the consultant. Uh, Ms. Gouldson's firm has uh, done questionnaires of the Board of Trustees. She will be joining us at a meeting in uh, January of 2023 uh, for us to do a site visit for a, a number of the parcels that the trust uh, Board of Trustees have control over. Uh, and then uh, she'll do uh, some community outreach with the expectation by no later than May of 2023, she'll be able to release our action plan. And that should become our operating uh, manual, if you will, going forward. And so I think, um, although it's a nominal uh, ask, I think the contract is for less than 30,000. Um, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the output that we get from that. Again, I think if all things being equal, the town and the trustees would have been better served if they could have done that uh, back in 18 or 19, but here we are. So I think that action is critical. Beyond that, um, as you may know if you watch our meetings or attend our meetings, um, we, the Board of Trustees, are still trying to evaluate what I've been referring to as the Article 61 parcels. So you may recall back in the town meeting in 2019, there were, um, in the end, five groups of parcels, so letters A through E, um, with I think E being held off because it was the uh, Albro House. But the remaining four groups um, equate to, if memory serves correctly, I believe it's seven parcels. And so um, we have evaluated Zero Oak Street. Uh, we're now working our way towards, and I'm gonna look for anyone to help me, the depot that's in East Harwich, not the depot that's in North Harwich. Road. Say again. Road. Thank you, Depot Road. Now with Depot Road, as you may recall, there were the three parcels, J1, J2, and J3. Town meeting took action through an amendment uh, to indicate that um, J3 could not be <coughs> built upon, and that's because 90% of it is impacted by Vernal Pool. Um, however, as the Board of Trustees were discussing that group of parcels at our last meeting, um, some of the trustees thought that we were dealing with 28.11 acres, um, and that isn't the case. It's uh, just under 20 acres uh, because the original evaluation <coughs> that the Board of Trustees had on that area of town was done by Mass Housing Partnership, but it included parcels J4 and J6, which did not survive the article of the town meeting and are not presently under control of the trust. So what we're trying to do is re-examine, well, when I say re-examine, the Board of Trustees, separate from me, had gone through an exercise or exercises in 2019. Now that we're dusting off the playbook and looking at it in 2022, 2023, we're finding it's not as uh, they expected it was back in the day. So there are a number of parcels that originally may have been considered to be developed by the uh, Board of Trustees as Affordable Housing Trust that may not be able to be developed. So then the question we have to ask is, what are we as fiduciaries for those properties going to do? Are we going to try to find value in building on it or are we going to try value in disposing of it and using the proceeds of the sale to support our mission? Just one follow-up. How about it, man? As far as the, uh, the contract you have now for the action plan, mm -hmm. you, you said, was it April or May, you said you expect a completed action plan, so is that the final milestone? That contract will Correct. expire at that Yeah, um, it, it may be that the Board of Trustees may wish to retain J.M. Gouldson for other related activities, but that is the expected result of um, sometime, when, and, and we informed her that um, May is a little bit of a busy month for us because we have a thing called town meeting. Um, she, her firm may be able to accomplish that in April. Uh, in any event, that milestone, that capstone to that project is the production of an action plan that the Board of Trustees would then operate under. Thank you. 
All set, John. All set. Kelly. Um, so since I'm newer, uh, could you provide um, a brief summary of the categories that this money is usually spent on and roughly what percentages for those categories? Um, I think I can do the categories. that We don't really have percentages yet. And um, um, I will tell you that I'm reminding the trust that I'm fairly new as well, mm -hmm. uh, having taken over the chair last September. What we're uh, presently struggling with is we have a very straightforward, in my opinion, a very straightforward purpose. And it says that the trust shall dedicate itself to the preservation and creation of low and moderate income housing as required by DHCD. And so you may have heard about the large purchase that was made, 13.7 acres, just off of Pleasant Lake Avenue. Um, we are still trying to get our feet under ourselves to say, what are we going to do with that? One of the things that has sort of uh, overturned that apple cart is a presentation that I and a member of the Board of Selectmen participated in last month where there was a reference made by representatives of DHCD, so that state agency that really regulates the work that we are going and should do, to say that low and moderate income housing is less than 60% of the area median income. If that's the case, that sort of changes our assumptions on that, that um, parcel. So at this point for me, my recommendation to my fellow Board of Trustees is any assets that we have uh, in, in, fin in money form, we should retain uh, and we should try to build up our capital and then going forward, separate principal from interest and start doling out the interest. And then for that, I could give better percentages that you know a percentage of the seed money went for this program or that program. But um, I think it's fair to say we've been, uh, we the Board of Trustees have been greatly impacted by departures, arrivals, COVID, uh, and really just trying to reset where we're at so that um, perhaps in a year when we come back with a similar application for a similar amount of money, I might be able to say that we did um, buy-down programs or mortgage assistance or anything that gets to that and then tell you how we parcel that out and what percentage went for this and what percentage went for that. Um, but at present, we're sitting on um, in my view, a lot of land, uh, more land than money, and uh, more money than ideas. Thank you. That's the best answer I can give, but I appreciate That's the great. question. Yeah, I appreciate the answer. I'll come back to you, Mary. I want to hear the rest of the board. Um, Bob. Yeah, um, and actually just to follow up with Kelly, um, that whole issue that you discovered that um, you're really restricted to the 60% affordability or 60% mean income rather um, is there thoughts to change your charter to include what's generally known as workforce housing well if I may to start whether it's so we're still trying to work with DHCD because that that less than 60% is a right. massive change yeah um, I know many of us that have dealt in this realm for any number of years you know we were used to 50 was low and 80% was moderate, and there were the two, and don't exceed the 80%. For me, the problem came in at that presentation on November 16th, that that was little more than a month after we had the community engagement right. forum, and most people were talking about workforce housing. Mm -hmm. So to your question, our present trust purpose cannot allow us as a board of trustees to work on anything called workforce housing, however we define it, because every definition that's out there is usually greater than 80 or more often 100 to 120% of area median income. Right. So at the joint meeting between the Board of Selectmen and the um, Board of Trustees of the Trust, we talked about that topic. My sense from that meeting is um, there is not presently any momentum either with, um, through the Board of Selectmen or with the Board of Trustees to change that purpose. Okay. Having said that, as I've tried to offer for, for Ms. Barber and anyone else, we have plenty that we can do, okay. and there's plenty that we can do, in my opinion, related to low and moderate income. So whether the purpose changes or not, we should still be getting more active to support folks that need that assistance. 
Um, just <clears throat> a thought, if that should change and you include somehow change your charter to be workforce housing, CPC money can only go up to 100%. Thank you. Which I'm and, I, and if I could, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank your colleague for that information because um, I wasn't clear on whether it was 80 or 100. Right. Um, and so now that we know that, to me that is, uh, there's your Maginot line, right. don't go past that for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, my expectation is that we're still going to be operating right. under less than 80 percent, so I don't see us ever encroaching upon that CPC right. limit. Right. But who knows what the future holds. Thank you. That's Thank all you. for me. Thank you, Robert. Kathy. Uh, has the trust looked into any other funding sources? Uh, be beyond CPC or yeah. um, we haven't as of yet. However, that presentation that I mentioned, uh, the presentation on November 16th was sponsored by Mass Municipal Association for the Mass School Board, excuse me, Mass Select Board Association um, and administrators and managers were allowed to be on it. In that, they outlined a number of potential revenue sources outside of the CPA, um, outside of cell tower, um, but it was almost like ringing a dinner bell and saying, this is what we think is going to be there. Now everyone go after it. So we're waiting to see how the new administration approaches those and if those sources will still be there. One of the things that uh, Ms. Nickerson, our um, housing advocate, and I are meeting on tomorrow is to look at the... Um, I'm probably going to get it long, wrong. I'm going to look in the uh, this direction over here. I think it's the one-stop community portal, uh, which is the uh, the Commonwealth. So the uh, through the governor's office, is the portal specifically on the one-stop for community is related to housing. So that portal is open. Uh, they're looking for general statements of need, and that's due in March. So we're going to analyze that, and that could become a significant source potentially um, of some funding, whether you know we're successful or, or however many people go for it. But the uh, presentation in that regard, you know, where the discussion on AMI was very confusing, the presentation on funding sources was very clear. And so we have high hopes for 2023 to find more sources. And so if we, if the trust decides to move forward on a particular parcel of land and seek out an outside developer, mm -hmm. okay? Because I think, well, at least the one engagement, community engagement meeting I went to, there was a, like a general consensus that we'd rather not see the town in the, the building business. Right. <laughs> so uh, if you seek out a developer, what kind of funds does the trust still need to continue to provide to a developer? Uh, or is there nothing? So, I mean, are we talking mostly seed money for purchases of land, or are we talking you need to put in X amount for engineering, X amount for site development, et cetera, et cetera? To clarify, you're specifically saying CPC seed money. Yeah, I'm sorry, CPC seed money. Um, we don't have clarity of message right now for me to answer that. Um, other than for me to say that regarding the, um, the 13.7 acres off of Pleasant Lake Avenue, we've been having ongoing discussions at the board of trustee level of what type of request for proposal are we going to do? Are we going to consider selling that land using the proceeds to fund more affordable housing? Can we sell the land? Um, if we then say that we want to develop it, are we going to offer the land for a nominal fee, like a dollar? Are we going to offer the land for uh, use, exclusive use by a developer for 99 years under a lease? Those conversations are still ongoing at the trust level. For me and for this application, what I would hope that my colleagues and I um, get um, more proficient at is looking at, okay, so that's a big development, uh, a big exercise that could come into to play um, for a low and moderate income housing in, in Harwich. We can still be a fiduciary like other towns trusts do 
and offer buy-down programs, mortgage assistance, or any other programs that have less to do with bu us building or having someone build on, on land and more to do with supporting families that have those income levels below the area median income. And so when I talk about seed money, and that's why I feel more comfortable um, presenting to you folks than I ever have before, it's because I've analyzed far deeper than I probably should have, but everything to do with the trust and our purpose. And so I have a very clear sense for myself. I, I don't know if you know, one of my colleagues is here behind me, if the others do, but I would say it's on me as chair to try to get everyone there to preserve and create low and moderate income housing in Harwich. That's a simple task. And it's broad enough that we, the Board of Trustees, should be able to come up with an ample number of programs or outputs that justifies you folks recommending to town meeting that we get at least half a million dollars a year to do that. And so the 13.7 acres, we're still talking about that. We, I hope that we have some definitive conclusion. We might have to rely upon our, our vendor and the action plan. Um, in her questionnaire, that was one of the things I asked. Um, not that it was a secret questionnaire, but there I go, I just revealed, is please give us guidance on we have not just the 13.7 acres, but if I tallied it all up, I would imagine that across town, the Board of Trustees of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund have I think a conservative estimate would be more than, say, 75 acres of land. You know, we've got 13.7 here. We have just less than 20 there. What are we to do with that? And what do we do with the big one that we have right now that everyone's focused on? Because we did use CPC funds. There's no question that we use that with maybe a smattering of cell tower revenue. So um, for me, I hope it's more than just uh, selling um, for the purpose of development, I certainly agree with you. I'm in that camp of the town can do many wonderful things. The town should not be building. You know, right. we should not be the lead on projects like that. I mean, it's just that, you know, we as a committee, you know, our job is to sort of vet these applications. Mm -hmm. And this application has like three sentences that were <laughs> total. And it's hard for <laughs> us, and it's hard for us to put this in the public uh, on, on our website and mm -hmm. at the library and for anybody who's looking to find out what this is about before they go to town meeting to really know what the trust, what their intentions are for the use of a half a million dollars. Sure. I think that's a fair point and I and think it's, it's, a, and it's yes. a fair discussion that we, the Board of Trustees, really need to continue our discussions and beyond discussions come to some hard, fast conclusions sooner rather than later so that everybody has comfort that we know what we're doing. I'm good. You said? Mm -hmm. Mary. Just a question. Jill, is she the one that did the um, housing production plan back in 2015, 2016? Um, is she the consultant? I, if, if I answered, it would be a guess. However, what I do want to emphasize is she literally wrote the book on affordable housing trusts. That is to say, she was the contractor that Mass Housing Partnership hired and, and the, the short-term title I give it is, So You Want to Be a Housing Trust. Um, she wrote the book on that one. She may have been involved. She, she's recognized, I think, across the Commonwealth as a so critical resource and all that. So I, I just wonder, the, the name sounded familiar to me more so than just this quick stop and start that, that we had with a brief meeting with, with the Housing Committee, um, the, which, I, which to me is just good news because it's not like if she is the same person then it's not like it's the first time she's seen our community and looked at definitely our, not her first uh, our, um, right. and our staff um, the other uh, piece I just had a question as you know I have done more digging into Yarmouth obviously because of where I am now mm -hmm. and um, I was interested to learn and I don't know whether we've ever talked about it here at this board that when those two developments on 28 were built, that the housing trust in Yarmouth never owned the land. They strictly did it as a uh, per unit contribution. Right. So they actually went out to bid 
for a developer with the purpose of, I think theirs was the purpose of converting rundown motel sites, mm -hmm. and then the developers who bid on on the projects actually had to put the the land projects together. So the town Smart kept its way hand. To go. So the town kept its hand clean. <coughs> it's, it's clean in that respect. So, um, is is there ever a possibility of flipping? And, and going that route as well, where you can then kind of realize as a buy down, I guess you treat it like a buy down, right, on a on a unit to, to help a developer um, get up and running, and then you're not, I guess you're not dealing with the land issues that you're dealing with now on a daily basis. Sure. So the, the, believe it or not, the quick answer to the, the last point there is, yes, there is that potential. Yeah. Uh, what I want to emphasize is us having Jen Goldson, so Jam Goldson under contract, knowing that Jen was the principal author of the two key documents put out by Mass Housing Partnership on this is how you build an affordable housing trust mm -hmm. uh, and trust fund. And these are things that, these are uh, almost like a manual. So the first one is how do you get, start, uh, how do you get it set up? And the second one she wrote is how do you operate? Yeah. Now we're getting our own version of how do you operate but I've reminded my board of trustees that in her book on how to, develop, how to build or how to become an affordable housing trust fund community, she talks about two types of trust funds. There's the fiduciary and there's the initiator. Now she also puts in there that there's a hybrid and that of course could be one that tries to do both of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, the irony to me is, as I've said to everybody, it's not my dirty little secret, nor is it dirty, nor is it little, that I understand the town of Harwich said, thank you, Yarmouth, find Yarmouth and replace Harwich, and there we go. They are acknowledged on Ms. Goldson's manual as an example of a funder. And there was some question as to whether those two projects meant that they were an initiator, and you know what we know, and what Ms. Nickerson knows by talking to her counterpart in your town. The town of Yarmouth is a funder, is a fiduciary, so they get money and then they find ways to surrender some of that money for the benefit. And so to me, that was a massive discovery. We built ourselves after Yarmouth, and Yarmouth is literally still quoted in the book on trust funds as an example of a fund door. And that's why at the joint meeting the other night, I referred to the trust as a fiduciary. We simply handle assets and dispose of those assets for the benefit of others to do projects. Understood. So thank you for that, by the way. So yes, we can contemplate any of those, mm -hmm. um, but the fly in the ointment is we own 13.7 acres of contiguous land um, at a significant value or cost, I should say, whatever the value is now. What are we to do with that? There was not a plan of action. John. Yeah, just to follow up on the conversation about uh, income levels. Um, it strikes me that in this conversation so far, there's been no discussion of where the need is. I mean, clearly there's a need for low-income housing, but if you're restricted to just 60% of area mean income, how, how does that relate to the actual need versus 100%? And it strikes me, and this is not my area of expertise at all, but it strikes me if you're talking about 100% area median income, you're talking about a different set of workers than if you're talking about 60% sure. of area median income. <clears throat> so my question is, is determining and quantifying the need, is that part of the remit for your contract for an action plan? Is that a discussion that's being had by the board? Where is the need? And if you are restricted to 60%, is there sufficient need there for you to satisfy? I suspect the answer is yes, but I wonder how you're addressing those things because it would seem that that, that would lend you some direction in how to proceed. Um, for me, um, the answer is an emphatic and proud no. 
the uh, Board of Trustees has not quantified need yet, and part of it goes to what you just mentioned about area median income. But I want to tie back, and um, as you know, we, we the trust returned um, $100,000 back to you folks. Um, when I became part of the trust, we had a very um, <coughs> deep conversation about are we going to use CPC funds to have a housing coordinator because I would argue that it's that 100% level AMI or the trust uh, level. So that's why the town, uh, town meeting committing to the housing advocate, um, Brianna, or excuse me, Ms. Nickerson's been on the job just under two weeks and I've reminded everybody she is not, she is not the affordable housing advocate. She's the housing advocate and she is not funded by anything other than taxpayer dollars set, you know, directly through the operating fund. And that means her primary role is exactly what you're talking about. Being the person in the community and for the community to establish what the needs are. And so I, gotta, I wanna brag about her for a moment if I could. Um, and were it not for a, a sick child at home, she might have been able to join us this evening, but I tell her to take the evenings off because you can. She comes to us from the Housing Assistance Corporation. Uh, she has a great background in that organization. Her job there was to be the point of contact for people that had nowhere to go and needed help with rental assistance, mortgage assistance, and it was a lot of the folks that would fall under less than 80% AMI. Before she worked for Housing Assistance Corporation, she worked for one of our local banks in the mortgage department. And that's what led her to Housing Assistance Corporation. She saw firsthand people struggling with, you know, with getting mortgages, with keeping mortgages, with finding housing. So it's not just the trust or the board of trustees that's gonna qualify need, but Ms. Nickerson is already doing that, has done that since day one on the job, um, and she is the primary point of contact I can give you folks more of an update in that regard, recognizing that her salary is not from this group, but she is already working on programs of community outreach so that we're gonna know very soon. And I might even hear tomorrow with her first weekly update to me of what she's found is need in the community. And then working with that staff resource, I can start reporting back out of, you know, what is the need for workforce housing if we talk about them in terms of greater than 80% or 100% or whatever, um, we have a dedicated resource and a wonderful person who is not only uh, sympathetic to the needs of the community, but empathetic. And so that's why I'm so excited about that. That's why it was great for us to give that money back, for you folks to repurpose it in the way you see fit, uh, and for the town to meet its commitment to finding out what the real needs are in the community. And she will work with the housing authority. I believe she was Hopeful to go to a meeting the other night, but one of the kids needed a pallet expander. Um, I'm saying too much, but anyway, <laughs> she's reached out to every one of her counterparts in, in our area of the Cape Cod. She has reached out to the organizations that she's worked with before. She's reaching out to all of the committees in our town that have, um, are in the housing space, real estate and open space, housing committee, housing authority, finance committee. And so that's where we're gonna have the greatest understanding of need and we're going to be able to do it in real time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joe. That's all very interesting and great, great news to hear. Um, on the question of need, does Harwich have a housing production plan or is that part of what's contemplated in, in the scope of Ms. Goldson's work? Because I know she does that type of work for other um, Not with Ms. Goldson and yes we do, but it expired. But I will also tell you that our Director of Planning and Community Development started Monday. Ah. <laughs> and, and both Mr. Halkiotis as our planner, Ms. Nickerson, they're gonna start working immediately on housing production plan. I'll also put out there um, that they're also gonna be tying back to the local planning committee working on the local comprehensive plan. And so we finally have the resources that we need. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I hired them, but we have two great resources and we're hitting the ground running. So Super. thank you for the question. I'll second. I, I was going to bring up the same thing as we do have the Howard production plan, but it is definitely outdated. Yep. But it does, if you look at it, it does give the different things, but doesn't give a clear priority. 
uh, but it does mention the different things that Howard does need. Yep. And can, anything else from any of the board members? Hearing none, thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Happy holidays, folks, and apologies to Charlie. I talked a lot. Charlie, I warmed him up for you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoy the holidays. Don't you have another Thanks. one? My man Charlie's doing bikeways. Oh, okay. You know, I'm going to change it up a little bit here. Um, follow, Eric, could you come to the podium, please? Sure. Real quick, can you reiterate what we sent around today as far as the email with senior softball is concerned? Yes, um, I did send out a letter just confirming senior softball is contributing the $20,000 to the, their restroom project. So you should all have a copy of that, I believe. Okay. Anything else for Eric? Thank you, Eric. Sure. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next on the agenda, um, we're going to go to R9 Oak Street Bikeways Crossing Light Project. The amount requested is $13,000. Good evening. Uh, I'm Charles Walkley, and uh, I'm representing the Bikeways Committee, um, asking for the uh, installation of the crossing light. Uh, this, in essence, is the same type of uh, lighting system that was placed in headwaters a year ago. Um, it's exactly the same, and uh, from all accounts, uh, the, the, the folks that installed the uh, lighting system from last year really uh, liked they changed their vendor and they liked what they got so they're on board with it they know how to install it is supported by the uh, town administrator and I just got a note um, today from uh, traffic safety committee and they uh, recommended it unanimously in their last meeting a couple days ago so um, I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> I, I have a list that I included in the package of uh, 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 the different sets of uh, crossing lights that have been placed, and this is just, just another one of those. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the application. Is Megan still involved with this? I believe that is true. Okay, I'm surprised she's not here tonight. Um, Okay, I'm going to open up to the board. We're going to start with Elizabeth. Um, it's going to be the same type of light as we have everywhere else, solar powered, all that. That is correct. It's, it's solar powered. It, it's a little bit different than some. It, it has an actuator, actuator switch on it as well. Uh, my feeling about that is that that is there if it malfunctions or if you enter that without tripping that switch, you have the opportunity to push a button and make that light come on, whereas some of the other oh, lighting systems don't. excellent. Yeah, because so some that don't. Nice and on, a, on a cloudy day, sometimes <laughs> they don't flash as much. But yes. I thank you, but they're great. Thank you. All set? Yes, thank you. Carol? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Uh, John? Yeah, so uh, in your proposal under the heading described their response referring to committees uh, you have a couple of places uh, referring us to something that is attached but I don't see anything attached I'm just wondering what it was you intended us to see and um, the, the, the attachments that are referred to are, are, is it from the um, application because I, I included um, several attachments with my um, presentation. Pictures. Okay, I'm looking at the soft copy, not the hard copy. So I guess you must have submitted two. John, separate. are you are kidding you? me? I, There's something you don't have that we have on our paper. 
Oh, oh my God. This is the comedy portion. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the straight man. <laughs> Would you like to see my paper copy? <laughs> That's all right. Okay. I, so I don't want to be between you two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, come sit over so, here next time. <laughs> John, you still have the floor. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I will take that as my action item to see if I missed the uh, the supplemental. Can I, can I just ask a question? That, could I have submitted that that would have been easier for you? You know what I mean? You must have gotten that off of the drive. I copied stuff off the drive, and I put. I thought I put everything in right. the folder. Oh, okay. Uh, I see. What but the, it, to answer the easiness question, is I think the instructions for preparation says pretty explicitly, please provide everything in a single document, a single PDF file. So, answering the easiness question, that would be easiest thing if you said it's provided them as two separate files, that's less desirable, just to put it that way. I don't know. I have to go back and look. Okay. I, I'm just not sure how to do that. You know, yeah, right. working with the PDF, that's all. I, I don't have that ability to add on to it, I don't think. Okay. Thank you. Know, I know you. what he's talking about or not. I'm still going to torture him about this. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to torture? Yeah. Uh, Mary. Yeah. I have no questions. Uh, I... I think we should continue to add to the the crossing lights. They are helpful where we have them, and I think we should continue the projects. So, thanks for the application. Um, I believe the last one you did, um, we didn't actually have to fund that. Didn't that you is fund correct. Some other money, that, grants, yes. <coughs> and is that a possibility for this one? Are you reapplying, or is that funding gone? That I, that I believe that that funding is gone. Okay. And to answer your question, I, I think that we're always looking for a, another funding method if we can come up with it in this sort of ever-changing environment we're in. And, and uh, if something comes available, we want to jump on it. We have contacts at um, Cape Cod Commission and whatnot. We try to stay abreast. Yeah. Right. So, yes. That's it for me. Thanks, Bob. Kelly? Hi. Uh, so in the attachments, the recommendation from Sean Libby said we'd be very safe at $12,000. I, I interpreted that as the request for $12,000, um, but the request is for thirteen. dollars Could you just provide a breakdown for materials and then overhead like contingency and stuff? I, I, I think that the, he based that on the fact that that was the, the cost a year ago. So he in his mind, I think, said, well, if it cost 12000 a year ago and when we bought it three years ago, it was uh, 9000 or ten. that he advised us to ask for the thirteen because he thought it would cover increases in that cost. Did you get a quote from the vendor just to make sure it's covered? I'm not sure. I don't want to answer. I, I, I think that he did, but okay. I... So? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, every single year when you submit an application, you do a thorough job of submitting, you know, all the information, um, and the cost has been pretty much around eleven to fourteen thousand, depending on. And you always return them any funds that are not used uh, in a very timely fashion. So uh, I'm a big supporter of these, and I think that that particular location has. Uh, long needed a um, uh, safety yes. light there. I, I, Are they concerned at all that it's going to really slow things down because of the you know, park and then? Yes, the I I, I understand the question, and they came and um, a traffic engineer from the Cape Cod Commission came and looked at it with the um, people. I think Mr. Libby and, and uh, DPW and decided that that would be the best way to go. They looked at that intersection and the one on uh, 124. Right. One on 124 is a whole different subject, right. but felt that that would be adequate for that. And yeah, I understand and I, I am aware that the 
Brooks Park is increasing its numbers of cars that go in and out of there, but I might make the ob observation that they will now have the ability to look across the street, they'll see a blinking light. And it's hard for them to see because of the angle of the bike path. That it, for gentlemen like me, I can't turn my head that far, but I can look straight ahead and, and see that, that blinking, so there, I, there's a warning that there's a, somebody coming from some direction. So I think, will it slow it down? Possibly, yes. Okay. Just Hopefully. Just curious. <laughs> Also, anything? Oh. I'll just make a supporting comment. Um, as a user of that path, I agree it would be helpful to have this added and also experiencing the uh, vehicle traffic along that stretch. I don't think slowing down would be an issue. I think it would be a help because it definitely exceeds the speed limit. Be good. My comment, do you generally look for quicker reacting unit than what is out there today so there's not that delay there's a significant delay in every one of those units yes there's a significant delay and there's a constant um the the unit placed at headwaters they felt was a, a better there's a lot of uh malfunction to to the to the units and they're continually going out and readjusting them and setting where they uh, are tripped and where they aren't and so that has been a big big concern to dbw and they've been they've been very diligent to keep them up we've all seen where, where they didn't work properly but uh from my understanding the 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 Crossing at headwaters, they are a lot more comfortable with and felt had a lot less miscue. So uh, to answer your question, I'm not sure. I don't know that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody, any, anything else from the board members? Thank you very much Thank for you. your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, HP4, Brooks Academy Exterior. Preservation project. The amount request is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Would you please come to the table and identify yourselves? Well, I've had the pleasure to speak before almost all of you before. David Spitz, chair of the Brooks Academy Museum Commission. I'm very pleased to have Lynn Spencer here. Welcome. Thank you. Lynn is one of the two principals of Spencer Preservation Group, and their name is on the presentation tonight. They've been with us for a little bit over a year, and they have as much experience, I believe, as any historic architects and preservationists in the state. So we have very good guidance with their involvement. And um, we're going to talk, probably roll both of these uh, projects together. Lynn is going to do the presentation as she's talking. The only, I've submitted electronically um, a copy of the slideshow and I'm going to pass out to you hard copies of the two cost estimates for each of the two projects. So uh, with that, um, I'll be answer, able to answer a few questions about the overall process and how this fits in and then um, most of the questions you can direct to Lynn. Great, thank you very much. Very glad to be here. I have been in Harwich before, where um, I was involved some years ago looking down those columns from the very uh, upper side when I was a consultant to coastal engineering. And before that, I was involved with um, the old schoolhouse and the west, well, the, the two schoolhouses here in town. So I, w I will say that it's a pleasure to be here. I sit in your seat, Mr. Chairman, in my own community where I chair community preservation, and I understand some of the challenges of stretching dollars and making good investments. So with that, if you don't mind, I'll just go to this you point. You have the floor. Move on, okay. Thank you. So when David says that I have, we have as much experience as any other firm, it will suggest that we've been around for a while, and that is true. <laughs> Um, our firm specializes in historic preservation and the rehabilitation of historic properties, and it is with real pleasure to talk about the Brooks Academy, a building that has served the town for 
you know, 180 <laughs> years plus, a building that has both heritage, identity, and purpose. So I don't know who's advancing the slides. Oh, that's my friend over here. So here we have the, on the left, the building today, on the right, an historical view. And you see there's a little bit of contrast between the two. Mm, paint colors, perhaps, on the doors and, and at the uh, cupola. So let's go to the next image. As I said, this building has had heritage and identity. It served as a place of learning for many, many years. Um, and, you know, m countless young people went through the classes in this building. To build a building like this with a Greek, uh, Greek revival style is a big source of identity. This is the idea of really classical learning, a place, um, <coughs> of, of that, a place that says, that says exactly what it is. It's a place to be elevated and to be inspired. When the school, the education part of the, the academy changed, it went on to become basically the home of the historical society, the town museum. And we can see that this place is chocked full of both exhibits as well as stored collections. One of the most magnificent collections of decoys probably in the country. But it, it is, it's a place that is challenged in terms of space and space use. So at the same time, um, it's also challenged by the age of the building and the changing building codes. At the time that this building was built, there was no building code. Today we live by building codes today for life safety, for protection, um, and you know, for the safety of all. In 2018, the Historical Society commissioned a comprehensive master plan. This building was examined from top to bottom by a talented architect with a team of, of consultants, including structural engineer, mechanical engineers, and curatorial advisors. And they came up with a number of recommendations for improved display and storage space, for archival storage, for access for research and study by everybody, which includes people with disabilities, and for basic building preservation. One of the things that the original builders did <laughs> was to build their building in a very straightforward way, in the way that you might do in the 1820s and 30s. And with that, we have a building whose foundations were not adequate. They were you know, basically fairly shallow stone foundations laid in sand. And as we know, living on sand is not, you know, building on sand is not a recipe for, in, you know, permeab, permit, permanent durability. So the project that we were engaged to work with the Historical Society and the town of Harwich on was to actually build a solid foundation, provide a solid foundation. We worked with Structures North, the structural engineer that had done the initial assessment and study on this. And you'll see you know, a kind of eye-crossing series of diagrams here. After an initial round of bidding earlier this spring, when the bids came in above budget, we, we sort of took a pause and put it out to bid again, basically the same project, but a different time in terms of schedule. No longer were contractors in the summer slammer kind of bill mode. They could be in a, in a mode of saying, yes, we can get this into construction. We can work on this over the winter. We have a bid price with Campbell Construction, an excellent firm that, w that really does have a particular um, experience with working with historic buildings at $1,189,000. So that was a good move to bid again and to get that project moving. Tonight, I'm here to talk with you about the next project. The application is for a project that deals with the exterior, the protection of the exterior envelope on all elevations of this building. And you're seeing in these images, you've got the original um, for a Greek Revival building with the wing from the later, um, the, the early 20th century. So it's a large building complex with 
many windows and many, many features to it, including that wonderful front portico. If you look closely at the building today, as we have, you can see that not only do we have peeling coatings, but we have it, that peeling has exposed woodwork, clapboards, trim. We can just keep going with some of these images. So what we're proposing to do is to actually do a thorough preparation job, removing the loose and scaling paint, using lead safe practices. We are not proposing to abate to the, the base coating. We feel like there's, there's you know, capability of, of removing the scaling paint, making the repairs, and then recoating the building. I want to remind everyone that paint is a protective coating. It is a way of protecting the woodwork underneath. If we go to the next slide, the one thing I also want to say is you know, we do look at this building as a series of phases. In a future phase, the front portico deck will be actually restored. The front portico will, the, the current master plan conceives of entering the building through the front doors instead of the side doors. And so instead of having that accessible ramp go to that side door, which is actually the hinge of the L to the main block, you will be entering through the front door. Oops, you want to go back for a second? Thank you. Um, and, why, and why is that? Well, partly because at that hinge of the L, the wing to the main block, the future elevator or limited use limited access elevator will be installed. So this building will be accessible on all floors to the public. And that right now is a real deficiency. So, so that's something that really wants to be addressed in a future phase. And as part of that future phase, the handicap ramp will be relocated to the front portico and the front portico deck re repaired. So I know I have limited time, so I, <laughs> I do appreciate I'm rushing right along here. Um, so we have a budget breakdown that shows what our assumptions were for that request of $250,000. What we said is there's going to be staging and protection because, of, as you know, this is an older building. It, will ha it has lead paint on it, so both workers and the public need to be protected, so there will be steps taken with scrims and so on to, to protect the building during the, the painting project. The painting project will require the contractors have lead safe practices in hand and have all workers trained in those practices. So that means the usual price that we see for scraping and, and painting of around $5 a square foot is jumped up to $10 a square foot for this budget analysis. What we did was we measured the, the area to be, to be coded and made that calculation. We also have carried $50,000 for carpentry repairs. We know that more will be revealed than we can see right now, so we've, we've made that allowance. Um, and then we've carried general conditions, overhead and profit, insurance, and so on. The other thing that we have included here is an escalation in inflation. We all are aware of what that has become for us. So we have a construction total of $204,000. We carry a contingency of 10%, and then we carry architectural fees. So that's how we came up to $248,900 or $250,000 is the request. So with that, I'll just take a pause and hear your questions, if that's all right, Mr. Chairman, on this portion of the presentation. Okay, thank you. We'll open it up to the board. Elizabeth. Um, I'm not familiar with this kind of project, so I don't understand um, overhead and profit. You're not going to make a no, that's the, that, make... that's that's the contractor's overhead and okay. profit. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's all that amazing. all that until you get to construction total is in the contractor side of things. Okay, thanks. I just sure. I'll settle this. Yes, John. Okay, one quick question in the uh, short paragraph narrative 
in the proposal, um, uh, the second last sentence in the main paragraph is some deterioration has been identified and will require repair of clabbards and water table issues prior to painting. What are water table issues? Um, the, w the water table is where the clabbard stop at the edge of the foundation. Uh, where's my friend here? Which one is it? Keep going. Keep going. No? I mean, if we can just keep forward. Uh, let's go back for a second. If you don't mind. we feel that there's going to be some real deterioration at the water table. So I think that the app, when David was preparing the application, he had that very much in his mind. Okay, thank you. And I have one other question which really applies to both proposals. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tangled up in my mask. Um, the question is about uh, maintenance and ongoing costs. This kind of uh, legacy building techniques are expensive to maintain. And you're not proposing to strip all the paint off of there. You're going to um, scrape and chip what seems to be loose and painting over it. I think I, is that correct? That's correct. So my guess, and please correct me if I'm way off here, but the lifetime of that kind of a repair is maybe five or ten years at the most. And the building is still, and the paint will begin to, to deteriorate within a year or two. And the building will be exposed uh, again to the elements in increasing way over the course of, I'd guess, five or ten years. So my question really is about the long-term plans for this building. Um, I mean, clabbered, painted clabbered siding is notoriously difficult to maintain. And the same thing happened, ha the same thing applies to, to the style windows that I understand are in there. They're mm -hmm. very old fashioned. Um, they need, windows like that need to be reglazed and repainted uh, on a very regular basis because what, uh, unless there are some new fangled kind of putties that are used to replace old-fashioned windows, that stuff begins to separate from the mullions and muntins. And uh, again, that's, and the window part is even a more expensive repair than the siding. And so my question is, are you going to be coming back to us in five years asking for money to basically do this work over? Or do you have some other uh, budgetary plans for how you're going to deal with, now that you've invested a significant amount of money into these repairs, how are you going to make sure they remain in good shape? Thank you. David, do you want me to give a, a go at that, or do you want to start first? Well, I'm simply going to say that I asked that very question of um, uh, Lynn as we were putting this together. Um, and from there, she's the one to answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, David. So I appreciate the, the, the question very much. I think that, that in our experience, yes, we start with a very good preparation job um, and, and a very good choice of paint coating. So there are certain coatings that are superior to others. And for instance, we, have, we tend to favor Sherwin-Williams duration as a very good paint coating. Um, it would, we also are very mindful of not only the preparation, but the application process. So we observe that all very carefully. We have seen, and, and I think you, you all, because you are living in a town of wooden buildings with paint coatings on them, you're probably very aware that various elevations will age and weather at different rates. For instance, the south elevations will tend to go first 
and you know, and and the, moving around the building, you'll see the you know somewhat longer life with other elevations than the south. So, what makes sense to us is to actually get on the building, do a very good job, watch the contractors carefully, because that's the work that we do as, uh, as architects. We're involved with construction administration and make sure a good job is done with good quality paint coatings. The second thing that I think is very important is understanding that paint failure is not just a matter of exterior weathering. It's oftentimes a matter of moisture and how it is escaping the building. So I think good thinking on how we uh, actually ventilate and insulate the building is also part of the, that was part of the master planning um, exercise that was done a few years ago. On the matter of windows, I'll get to that later, but I can tell you now it's a lot of the same thing. Good choice of, of quality materials, the right materials for the application observing the process during the actual construction itself, preservation work itself, and then making sure that the storm windows are not trapping moisture, which is part of the reason why we see deterioration. So just to follow up, under the best possible assumptions about how well the preparation goes, mm -hmm. how well moisture is controlled, and given local weather conditions, how long do you expect this job, and it, again, it applies to both proposals, how long do you expect these things to last before you need to do an equivalent? I would say that on the south elevation, you'll be looking at seven to 10 years. Um, if you, and, and then on the other elevations, you'll be looking at 10 and so on. Um, and I say that based on our, I hate to say it, I've been around long enough that I've been seeing these. I track the, the paint coatings and the paint jobs that we've seen, we have had. So I would say that that's reasonable. But I will say this, the moment you start to see some paint peeling or some deterioration, get out there with a paintbrush and hit those areas. Um, I think the, the, the alternative to wood is not really acceptable in a, a historic building like this, a legacy building. So we're living with wood, and the question is, how do we help it endure? Thank you. All set. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, I just have kind of a follow-up to John's question um, and, and your comment about <coughs> moisture, because I'm noticing the, the timeline for this work would be fall, winter. And I always think of that as not usually when outdoor painting happens. I'm looking, um, work will proceed in the fall, winter, and should be done prior to the museum scheduled opening in the spring. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. And if you have a better answer, then we'll change that schedule. I think we will change that schedule. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I didn't see that, but no, we would not advise painting work in the fall and winter. Oftentimes it is very good in the fall if it's dry, but you know the, you know the Cape very well, <laughs> so, so you watch the weather. And that's the other thing, uh, thank you John for that question, but that's the other thing, making sure the conditions are, pro are proper when paint's being applied. And may I ask one, one other Go question? Go ahead. Um, just on the um, cost estimate, so on the, um, you know, you have per square foot estimates uh, for the painting and, and percentages for some of the other costs. For carpentry re repairs, um, I mean, it, was that just a, a ballpark? And, that, that, and that is my, you know, that's what, when Doug and I are looking at this and we're saying, eh, that seems to be about right. I mean, quite honestly, what we'll have to do, if we are engaged to work on this, what we would be doing is identify the areas of deficiency that we can really get to, but then we would include unit prices for other areas. So there would be a defined amount in the contract for you know, un unforeseen or yet to be seen conditions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, along with the painting issues John brought up, uh, describe the difference between what was done with the library and what you're doing here, because wasn't the library a complete strip? 
It, it was, and in fact, Doug Manley, who is now my business par partner, was the architect with the, previ with the previous fir firm on the library. In that case, the case was made to reset the clock by stripping down to bare woodwork. Um, and I think that that was a combination of actually judging the amount of paint accumulation um, on the, you know, on the siding and the trim. We just don't think this has quite gotten so far that actually going back to bare wood is, is, is necessary at this time. If there was lots of money, maybe. <laughs> but. I'll, fo I'll follow up. Um, we started putting together the capital plan for this a year, a year and a half ago. And we were carrying a larger number for this item. And it was specifically Doug Manley's input that said, you do not have to do the same as the library for the reasons Lynn has stated. And this is the only case so far where the cost estimate has gone down it's before the project's actually done, but. Yeah. Okay, thank you, that's all. Mary. So questions for me, I think everybody's, Bob and John have hit my main questions on the painting. Thank John. you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this question does pertain to both projects, but I'm curious if you've explored additional funding possibilities since you're asking us to fund the entirety of the projects. I'll, I'll do this. The, um, we put a, together a major application for uh, the cultural affairs a couple years ago. We have looked at historical grants. We've got some accessibility issues. We'll be looking at those so far. Uh, I haven't landed any of those grants. The other main source of money is the capital plan for the town. The town is carrying a fairly large amount, as you can see from uh, both of our two uh, town meeting plus what's currently online uh, for the upcoming capital budget. So there is a lot of money that the town administrator has put in that the Board of Selectmen is reviewing for additional money to CPC to aim towards this building. Did you clarify what you just said? No, I don't they, understand. they can't do, well. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. Well, let me. It, it's, it, administration, Board of Selectmen, they have no control over the CPC funding. Right. So if they have additional monies that they have outside of CPC, yes, they can direct it to the project. Absolutely. And they are showing that right now. They're showing over a million dollars to be devoted to this project. That's in the five-year plan. Non-CPC money? That's right. right. Okay. I'm just, that's, I'm just trying yeah, to get it, clarification. It just got caught up in the, yeah. the language. You know, it's one of these, I'll believe it when I see it. It's in the capital plan. <laughs> it has to make it into the actual one-year budget. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've got it started. Okay. I'll say okay. Uh, yeah, one of the things that um, I brought up a couple years ago was um, gutters. Um, because if we were going to spend the money on the foundation and part of it had to do with moisture deterioration, uh, what were we going to do? I actually walked around the building today and mm -hmm. gutters seem to be in place and operational. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, is there any plans for additional drainage down the road uh, like dry wells, French drains, or whatever, to do more to preserve the new foundation when it's in. Mm -hmm. but, but and again, it's back to that whole moisture, you know, question. All right, Lynn may be able to say more as far as what she's seen in the building. My understanding is that this will come under um, Sean Libby's maintenance budget to be funded by the capital plan, non-CPC money. That may change, but that's where things stand now. So there is something else planned. I cannot tell you any details. But additional drainage is something that will be addressed yes. sooner than later with regards to preserving whatever money the town, whether it's CPC or non -C CPA or non CPA funds that are put in. The big foundation project is now scheduled to begin right after the first of the year. Once that building has been supported, once everything's moved around, we will see whether the town's fairly conservative estimate of work that'll have to be done to fix interior walls is needed. But we are expecting come May, May town meeting to be able to have money for any interior repairs, 
plus any of the water type of work that we're not talking about. So that should come out of um, this coming year's budget, whether that's funded by, um, oh, what's the word, um, free cash or something else, I can't say yet. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. David, are we talking structural repairs inside the building? Yes. There's, there's some serious fissures in there. Yeah. Above yeah. the headers. Yeah. So that's what we're talking. Yeah. Okay. May I just Go respond? Ahead. Go ahead. No, as part of the foundation project, yes, we are reinforcing the floor. We have a complicated structural package going on for the first floor framing as well as that new foundation. Okay. Will you be removing the cupola from the building? No. Does the cupola need any severe restoration? Not according to what I understand from the structural report. That had, there was some serious work that was done on that several years ago. Okay. So, whomever you hire as your contractor, they will have a lead certificate. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Is, the, is the thought that the building will be enveloped when the work's done? I would think, you know, this is a matter of means and methods. We will actually be saying to them, you know, you must protect the public and your workers. So the obvious way to do that is to stage and, and scrim it. Okay. And that's why there's a fairly healthy budget for that. Alrighty. Is there any more questions from any member of the board? Thank you very much for your presentation. No, no. I, 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 I was going to say, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, may I roll on? And I know I've, I'm, I may be taking too much breath. time. No. <laughs> it's actually no, the most important fine. part to me. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what, what are windows? They're the eyes of a building. That's how the building sees. That's how you see it. So. Where's my friend? Oh, good, there, there we are. Thank you very much. Do you want to do this presentation? Because you really seem to be right ahead of it. So this building actually had wonderful illuminate, natural illumination, as you would expect with a schoolhouse. So we have actually, to me, which <laughs> Doug and I were kind of fascinating, you have 15 over 15 light windows. So. For those of you who know about taking care of old buildings and windows, you would say, wow, that is a lot of glazing. That is a lot of work involved here. The, the upper floors are 15 over 15. Then we drop down to 15 lights over two lights. It suggests that you know different generations of, of thinking went into when those windows went in and when they were replaced. By the way, I'm not assuming that we have much we may have some original clapboards and we may have some original windows, but you know, there's, there's been repairs and maintenance on this building over time. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of original glass in that building. Oh, and yeah. the glass is lovely, so it may not be 1826, but it's certainly 19th century glass, if not the original glass. So what we are preparing, proposing is a window conservation project. And I'll just tell you, an experience that I had at Old North Church in Boston many years ago where we were tasked with, you know, an assessment of that incredible landmark building. We saw gl defective glazing on those magnificent building and uh, uh, these really magnificent windows. In part, we felt because of the storm windows and the way they had been installed and were not able to vent. We took the storm windows out of Old North Church and restored those windows, and what did we find based on the paint analysis? Those were the original 1723 windows, which was kind of amazing. So yeah, I think you could, you'll could. you have very, very early glass, if not original here. You'll have very early windows. The task is to conserve them. So what we're proposing with this, and if we just go on to the next couple of slides, my friend, Let's go to the one after this one. You, you see what we have here. You, you've all looked closely. When you look past the storm windows, you see that the glazing is starting to fall apart. The paint is falling apart. That exposes things. What we're proposing with this project is that the windows would be removed, temporary protection put in place, and the windows would take it, be taken to a 
shop where people have experience with this kind of thing. The defective glazing would be removed. The glass will be labeled and set aside so it goes back into its original location. You know, any woodwork defects would be, the paint, the windows would be scraped down. Any woodwork defects would be, would be addressed. And then the, gla then the glass would be reinstalled in a proper glazing bed. Honestly, not with proprietary in the hardware store glazing, but with glazing compounds that are really meant to last. We are likely to see lead glazing used here that was quite common as well as lead paint. So it's, it's quite a delicate process to, to undertake this thing. But right now, for instance, we have three projects, um, one of which has just been bid, but we have three, three other projects that are being bid for window restoration. That's what the, is done. We're just finishing a, a project for the Easton Town offices where 120 windows have been, re re been removed, restored, and reinstalled. So that's what we're proposing here, is in fact to actually address the eyes of the building by a true window conservation project. And yes, this can be done with public bid contractors. We we've have the, the project I'm just finishing in Easton is a good example of that. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see the budget breakdown. And what we've done is actually identify the cost based on the window type, the 15 over 15 windows versus the 15 over two windows. We've carried a, an amount for re carpentry repairs to those windows. And then we've carried the usual markups for general conditions, overhead and profit, and so on. So that's where we get to. And yes, when we actually ran these numbers, we're above what David had applied for and I had earlier advised him for, so it's a shame on me, but yes, it's a higher request than, higher amount that is being shown than the $350,000 uh, request. I had already bumped you up to 440. Isn't he brilliant? I'm telling you, he's brilliant. You're already giving him back 30,000. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't want to give anything back, David. Change your work order. I'll be happy with either 410 or 440. <laughs> My last slide is this, though. I, I would like, and I know that you, you are stretched on dollars, but I would like to make this pitch, and that is to try to combine these two, if possible. The, the, exterior envelope painting project with the window project in one project. I think you're going to save money when it comes to general conditions, staging, architect's fees, all of those things, if you can possibly make it one project. <coughs> thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to the board for this, Robert. Okay. Um, you mentioned the storm windows. I know those were done some years ago, not that yeah. many actually, yeah. and they were supposed to be architecturally correct for this type of building because it didn't have the it had it maintained shadow lines and all that. Yeah. But they because they're solid, you suspect that that's the problem uh, I, leading to it. And um, so, what is the solution to that? Well, we were calling for new storm windows as part of this project. Um, I think I mentioned earlier the, the need to make sure the windows, storm windows are installed correctly and are properly vented cannot be, un, it can't be over emphasized. Um, and I think that ha things got painted shut. I don't know if the widespread glazing failure that we're observing existed before the storm windows went in or is, is a result of them. I don't know. But I, I think that we are just saying, you're going to be into this, you might as well actually replace well, those windows. So, so you'd replace them, what would you replace them with? I hate to say it, but there's probably like one company right now that we, are, we work with repeatedly, and that is Allied, who makes a low profile, very solid storm window takes a long time to get them, but when you get them, they, they do endure. Yeah. Invented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, as far as the, uh, as I recall, um, I'm, 
pretty familiar with the building, but not real recently. The 1927 edition windows, which is that west wing and uh, the part of the overhead, the um, um, 1919 edition, uh, those windows did not look nearly as bad. As, I recall them as being pretty good shape. Is that no longer the case? I know the original building, they were, they were really bad. Really windows. bad, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah. you know, because missing wood, and they really need some restoration. But I'm just thinking about, does it need to be done all at once, other than your comment, like, like to do everything at once? Well, you know, I think that's a fair comment. You know, there will be differential weathering based on age and, and exposure. I, I think we made the general, it all really needs to be done. The degree of wood repair will vary. Um, if what we would be doing if we're engaged to work with you is we would then go and do a window by window assessment. So there would be, you know, we would call out glass issues, we'd call out wood defects and so on. So contractors would have a more specific menu for their, their bidding purposes. Um, okay, the, the other comment, not sure it's quite relevant, but the West Swing, David, as you know, all those windows are covered up with exhibits inside. And does that have an effect? I mean, why would we spend a lot of money now if you, they're not even windows to be used? I don't have an answer for you. That's a good question. I think you're not going to lose your windows. I mean, even though they may bl be blind on the inside, they're part of the character-defining no, no, features. I, I understand. It's just, um, it's just a comment, yeah. you know, about, you know, can those be done delayed or, no, I don't know. I just, I'm just looking away to maybe if we, I mean, decisions have to be made mm -hmm. that where do we cut that line and should you propose um, maybe a, a second amount if it's a half job, you it's know, okay. what, what it would be. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's better to do everything efficiently. Right. I specifically gave you two applications knowing that you usually get hit with lots of projects and yep. you know I'm, I'm a bit of a dollars and cents watcher so you know if you only need to do one project fine it would make a lot of sense the exterior preservation needs to be done mm -hmm. far fewer people other, other than your chair who's been talking about it for two years ha have noticed and commented on the window situation if we were to get the exterior preservation and the older building windows that would be a very good thing to go forward with. Okay. If we can do it all, that's even better. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to step in for a moment. David, what's your contingency on each one of these? It's in the budget. 10%. How much? 10%. It was 10%. Yep. 34000 on the on the window project, David. And, and you have an escalation and in inflation line as well above yeah. that. 20,000 on the uh, exterior. I can't see that blowing <laughs> through. I'm sorry. About 54,000 altogether. Yeah. For the total amount. For the, like any well, for the windows. Yeah. It's for the windows. So the, the windows is, the windows is um, 34,000. It just seems to me that the contingency is light. I'd I love see. to be able to say it should be more, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, but I'm cautious about these budgets. I think that's why David put it in at 440. He's got a smarter head than I have. They also have an escalation. escalation. Yeah, they also have no, inflation. Yeah. 4, yeah. Okay, so it's, that's so good. it's sort of 18%. No, it's, you don't just yeah. add the, the percentage. Um, but <laughs> the last time we did this, no, my the contingency was applied by the then town <coughs> engineer who we've unfortunately lost. He put in 25% and we ended up using all of it. I do believe. I took your original numbers, Lynn, and added 25%. I'd have to double check. So that probably is what brought it to 440. I can't explain the other one, though. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Good enough. <coughs> are we hiring a clerk of the works for this particular project, both of them? <coughs> we are hiring one for the foundation project. I understand that. But specifically, this pro these two projects. We haven't hired one yet. We've grown, we're going to have money left over from the article that was just approved um, because not all of that is being used on this project. So there will be quite a bit left over that could be used for this from this town-approved article. Okay. 
Could I just make a distinction, though? Sure. A clerk of the works is different than an owner's representative. So if you're looking for somebody to check the job daily, that's a clerk of the works. No, no, no. Day-to-day -day operations, that's a yeah. little bit different. That, yeah. That's up to the contractor. That's his responsibility. Yeah. I'm just looking for someone to take a gander overall to see that whatever procedures that you're discussing with us tonight are going to be put into place and move forward. That's all. Mm -hmm. To this point, we've been doing that with the architect. Right. Town administration wants more than that. So they have arranged for more than that. Okay. I, again, understood. Okay. Um, where did I start? I started. Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, you talked about doing both projects at once. Um, if we did that, I, I know you cannot at all be firm. What's your guesstimate? on how much, right now it's 600 and f something, almost seven, let's say $700,000. Now, if we did both um, together, how much do you think it would save? Do I look skyward or down? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just a guess. It's a very, difficult, it, it's a very, very difficult question. I, I, what's happened in the last year is is galloping inflation and labor and labor shortages that re have resulted into higher labor costs. So it's it's really hard to say. I my guess is there'll be efficiency. I just I would I'm just not in a position to say how much that would be. So it would, the same contractor that could do the painting would also be able to do the window. That's project. right, you would put okay. them together. And, and so therefore you, you would be saving on their general conditions, you'd be saving on their re-mobilization, you know, second, yeah. second yeah. mobilization, all of that would be a savings. How much it would right. be? Right, no, the, the money doesn't, that's impossible. <laughs> but, but it would just be the same, um, it would be the same contractor. Right. So, you know, both. just okay. imagine this, because a previous question came about the time of year to do this. You know, you may get to your town meeting, it gets approved, you know, things get put together, there's bidding in, in the late summer, you know, when plans and specs are done. You know, th the window project is a great thing to be doing over the winter. David will not love hearing this, but there will be good protective panels put in place. So you have an eager contractor who has winter work, and that should be beneficial. And then in the spring, they come in to actually work on the exterior cladding itself. Thank That's you. one way of beginning to think about right. it. That makes sense. Thank you. Also, yes, thank you. John. Okay, so. Just following on my previous questions, I, I just have to say that part of what is involved here, in my opinion, is perpetuating an obligation for maintenance on this building. And I don't see any discussion of how that's going to be handled. So I have one very specific question which may provoke more than one person in this room is what, what are the constraints that would get in the way of considering replacing these windows with something modern, something designed? <laughs> Just let me finish. <laughs> let him I, I said, no, it's a, it's, it's a question. Right. It seems to me that it might be actually cheaper to have brand new windows made and uh, and windows, and again, I don't know about materials specifically, but windows that would be, would require less maintenance, would have a longer life than these windows, which sounds contradictory since you've just told us these windows have been here for going on 200 years, uh, but it's still a concern. They haven't been there maintenance-free for 200 years. so. That's my question, and it's a two-part question. Mm -hmm. What sure. is being, what provisions are being made for the ongoing maintenance of this thing so we're not back here in five or 10 years 
um, contemplating another, at that point, even larger That's a larger simple expense. question, John. We don't do maintenance. We don't do maintenance. But it's still a, it's a concern about, I'm not, it's a concern about us um, granting a bunch of money for something that is going to for deteriorate. It's historic. That's, it's going to deteriorate. So deterioration is part of the historic characteristic of the building, I suppose. It's still a question. It's still an obligation for taxpayers, if not for us, to take care of this building. So I would like to hear something about what, how that is being provided for here. And the ancillary question is, I get why it's very difficult to contemplate how you would deal with that on the clabberds, because you're stuck with the clabberds. Practically, aside from what Mary is about to say, <laughs> You could replace those windows, and I want to understand why not. I'd like to hear that stated. And I don't know whether you want to answer this or you want to let Mary. Would you this. rather the chair redirect that question? I think yes, <laughs> please. I thank you, Mary. You have the floor. Okay. So first, it is one of the two buildings that I have sat in this chair for however many years now, and I say it every single time. They're the bookends to our local historic district. Everybody still talks about the exchange, exchange. building, and if I hear about the exchange <laughs> building one more time, I'm gonna lose my mind. <laughs> but we talk about that all the time. We have the ability to preserve that building, which is one of the two gems left in town, that's truly a gem. So you can preserve it in the right way. But to the ongoing maintenance, the town owns this building. The town has owned this building from the very beginning. The town owns this building and owns the maintenance on it. It's why I have advocated for using CPC funds, historic CPC funds, where possible, because whether it's coming out of CPC or whether it's taxpayer dollars or it's coming from our budgetary or our capital taxpayer dollars, it's taxpayer dollars that are paying for that building unless the the sun and the moon don't rise and, and some, somebody convinces the town to sell that building. So that is, to my way of looking at it, is it's a town building, it's a town obligation. We can preach until we're blue in the face that ongoing maintenance needs to happen, but that ongoing maintenance, it's a town building, just like the cultural center, the community center, this building, that maintenance should be ongoing and hopefully when this building and all of this money gets put into it the town will put together a, a maintenance plan that works for this building with the new materials but i will say before any anything gets demolished in that building it has to come before historic and i can tell you as one of the two members sitting on this board <laughs> and one of the five active members of that board it would um, take a miracle for, for uh, a, a modern window to be approved uh, in the, on a um, certificate of appropriateness that goes before the local HDHC. And I will, I will go on record that I would, I would be strongly against, and I'm, I'm impressed that Bob hasn't <laughs> beyond. Well, I don't want to violate open meeting laws no, here by talking historic stuff. Well, no, uh, it, and well, it's not. But well, it, it, it would. The, I would. I'll be honest. That would be a hard sell for me on historic, where you can fix original windows. That is something that, when we look at our certificates of appropriateness that are before us every month. It is a rare opportunity that, that we would see an application where that's an option. And to have that as an option uh, would be a hard sell for, for me. I just want to concern myself and this board with the CPC application in front of us. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that veneer, the, out, the outside of that building, it is truly at the end of its useful life. What happens after, this, if, if by chance the CPC funds this project, what happens after the fact with the town, with maintenance, is on the town. Mm -hmm. But we have the ability to fund this project. 
based on our requirements. So, yeah. go ahead, Rob. No, I'd just like to hear so, comments on what's been brought up. Well, the, I think the first. second, I, I really appreciate the comments about historic pres preservation and the protection of character defining features. I really appreciate that. You asked the uh, second question is, why not replace these with new windows? And I will tell you why. I mentioned earlier Old North Church, 1723 windows, based on the paint analysis. That wood, 1723, your wood, 1820s and on, old growth pine. I don't need to say too much more, but any of you who have worked with modern wood windows, which would be what historic would require, will understand that we're usually dealing with ponderosa pine, finger joints, and a lot of other things, unless we say mahogany. <laughs> And then we're into you know, a very expensive window job. I just have a project with the Southboro townhouse, their town hall. They wanted to replace their windows. We, we being docile and you know, trying to help out, actually went through a pricing exercise. The cost of the new windows in a way that would actually be long-lived versus short-lived was you know, nearly twice the cost of actually conserving the historic window. Plus, you've got the glass issue. So I, I think that, you know, I think that there's, you know, if you were in a situation where you didn't have a historic building and you didn't have a historic district that was mindful of this, you might be looking at something like an aluminum window. And then I will tell you that you might get 30 years out of your aluminum window, but you cannot <coughs> fix aluminum windows. You cannot fix vinyl windows. You can fix a wood window. Carol. Thank you. Um, you know, I think this presentation has been very compelling in terms of the need for this work. And I just want to explore this idea of combining projects because, um, you know, if both projects are needed, um, I guess, I guess my, my question is two-part. Um, is there a mechanism, maybe this is a question for the chair, um, to receive uh, information that would, I think uh, the question was raised earlier, give us, give us a sense of what the potential savings would be to combine the projects or, or price them in that manner so that I think, you know, al the alternate would be both would be funded at this l level and in this manner, which is um, not as efficient and would cost the town more. So is there, is there a mechanism to get that information from the applicant to give us that sort of combined proposal? That's one part of my question. Um, there's a request from a board member. Is so, that possible? So um, I have understood, whether correctly or not, the CPC can ask for revisions during the course of your review. Yes. So yes, we can give you that. Is there going to be any cost savings? I don't know, Lynn, but um, we can certainly give you a combined single application. Mm -hmm. I, I think, David, that would be the logical thing to do. I would go back to the spreadsheets and put them together and provide you the requested information. And one, one okay. small oh. Oh, sorry. Thoughts from the board about that particular question? Go ahead, Elizabeth. We get, if they don't spend all the money, if they end up being able to do it in tandem, do them together, and it costs less than what we gave them, we get that money back. So I don't think it matters to me whether we give them the money in two parts or in one part, because if, it, if they end up being able to do them together and save money, then we do the thing that we did two months ago where we'd go through all the money they didn't spend and get it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carol. Well, I guess I would, to, in response to that, I mean, that, that occurred to me as well, but I think, you know, would we specify or make a, a contingency that, that you have to bid them together and it should be the, you know, one contractor and you know, we would be approving two separate projects. So, you know, it could be two contractors. It could be, um, you know, I don't know. I, I suppose we could try to put
put that kind of contingency on, but would we be able to do that if we approve both projects separately? I don't know. Um, I, I do have one other follow-up, if I may. Um, and I guess it's, it's if, if the projects are separate or if, if town meeting only funds one, I mean, David, you said the painting, if I understood you correctly, the painting, the, the treatment was the higher priority. Yes. But if you then do the windows, aren't you going to have to redo the painting because you're taking wood off and, I mean, it would be more take expensive. Take them from to the inside. Yeah, you take them. Oh, you, you would, uh, yeah, you, you would remove the storms, take them out. So I think, we, I think they're relatively discreet, but it would be best to do them together. And I would do it with one contract package. Our, our opinion is that both of these projects need to be done. If you simply don't have enough money this year, we'd probably be back for the rest of it next year. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> so just, just my question, thanks, um, David. I understand the point of you know approving both both totals and and potentially bidding them together for potential savings. What I my only concern is that we don't stick to the line item numbers because they're gonna they're going to vary and you might have significant cost savings on one line item so that you're you know you're um, you're gonna save on say your insurance and your bonding, but your painting or your glazing might come out higher just because of of the market. So I wouldn't want to hold them to the line item estimates. I would want to hold them to the bottom line estimate for the total project, if that makes sense. And I think that's typically how we approve our, how we make our motions and how we approve our um, our numbers anyway, but I just wanted to throw that out there because I think those those numbers have could vary in any number of different ways when you're when you're looking at a combined project. So David well you know we're gonna follow obviously you guys control the money. But if you think you can go forward this year on both of these, from our point of view it makes sense to combine them into one project to update our numbers, I get back together with uh, Doug and Lynn, and, and we do that based on anything we've heard tonight, plus anything you may tell us afterwards, and put it in all in as one project. That's what I think would make the most sense. John, just a question. If we were to approve both of these proposals as they are without requesting a combined proposal, can we submit the two proposals as a single town meeting item? No, they're two separate. They're two separate proposals. But if they were to submit a replacement for the two proposals, which is a single one, then we could submit that as a single one. Then I would open it up to the board and let the board decide what they choose to do. Probably. Well, Mary, as uh, Kelly, that's been raised her hand here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't time. see <laughs> You gotta get it up there so I can. <laughs> Wait for the next page. I have the floor. You yes. have the floor. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question, but my main question, uh, or I guess uh, request, um, so the, the narrative for both of these projects it, that you provide is the same, so my request was that if uh, you do give us an updated uh, budget if this is combined then you could just include that as an attachment for both but I am curious if there is a benefit for combining the projects from a town meeting perspective well we're changing the format so that that's going to be a decision of the board um, Robert no I really would like to see it combined um, because I think it's very worthwhile to try to go for both. Um, I'm afraid doing them separately, and even if we uh, say we like both of them, that can still be split off at town meeting. And also Mary's point that if they're two separate, you can't move money from one to the other. You, you gotta, and you're better off if you're gonna, that money may flow different directions. It's better than just one big proposal. So, any 
Kathy. <laughs> I haven't um, ignored you. Yeah. <laughs> um, can we just get back to the storm windows for just a quick minute? Sure. Or the windows. Um, are the do the windows have like a weighted sash? Like what kind of mechanism? Yep. Uh, gets them up and down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Weighted sash. So, are like some of those weights missing, and they're going to have to replace them when they take the windows out? I will say that we haven't done the window by window analysis, but there's there's probably some likelihood that there's broken cords and that kind of thing. So the weights are stuck in the pocket. Right. Um, not impossible to take them out and and to so as part of what sash conservation would also mean is actually the weights would be dealt with. There would be weather stripping. It's not just you know the glazing and the painting, it's the whole window package. But like right now, the storm windows are a single piece of glass. Mm -hmm. they do, they're not like, uh, you know, the split, you know, one, whatever you call those, that go up and down. So my, I would assume that they're not, are they taken off in the warm <laughs> weather or they just stay on right they now? Just stay, they just stay on. They just stay on. So the windows inside are never opened. I because the storm window's on, so there's no air coming in. So yeah. So what's what is the goal? Is the goal to restore the windows? They're going to go up and down. But are we still going to have storms that are permanently placed on there that there's no access to fresh air, or do we not want any fresh air inside? I'm just trying to understand the windows. And that's that's a good point, and I'm sorry to move away, but can everyone hear? <coughs> There is probably limited interest in opening a lot of windows and letting the dust and the pollen and all that kind of good stuff into this building. But there may be occasions where, yes, they want to open the windows. So by having that meeting rail with a storm window, it would be possible to, re to take out the lower panel and put in a storm pan or a screen panel for summertime ventilation. It would be possible. For instance, with our recent town pro hall projects, that's exactly what we're wanting. We're doing this because people want natural ventilation, even though there's air conditioning, but they want natural ventilation for swing seasons. So I think that's, that's going to be a, a matter of really delving into this with the board and the staff at the, at the Historical Society and understanding what spaces they want, may want to have natural ventilation or not. But the storm window panel, I think right now it's just reading as a big fat sheet of glass and that I don't think does justice to those windows. But, yes. but like you said that these storm windows, you're not positive, but they may have contributed to moisture because they don't have any kind of ventilation. So I, I, what, I cannot what, say that. What are that. storm windows that are not ones that go up and down, you know, have a, access to a screen or something? How are those ventilated? They usually have weeps. Okay, so how hard is it to put weeps in the existing storm windows? Aren't those like little holes in the bottom that... The it, it, it may be possible, Kathy. I haven't looked at it with that in mind, but it may but be. But that is something that... Yes, it is. I mean, well, we've got... 52 Why? storm windows on this building. Oh, yeah, it's a and lot of storm windows. to think about replacing them all with something that's almost exactly the same, except that has, they have a couple holes, is kind of crazy. And that just kind of leads me into just another quick discussion about the usage of the building, because I don't know if everybody's aware, but the Historical Society has decided to move to a more recent research-oriented approach, less exhibits, less whatever. So that's going to change the use of the building a bit. And I'm hoping that the Brooks Academy Museum Commission is going to think about that in terms of maximizing the existing, you know, usage um, with these changes that are coming. I understand they're going to keep the Cranberry exhibit, but in terms of other exhibits, that's sort of questionable right now. Yeah, I'm not convinced that they're not reconsidering that decision already. But, um, 
It was just announced. No. I, I mean. I'm just based on, you know, comments that was made by a member mm -hmm. with the outgoing director present. So. But I mean, it's that's I mean, this this information just went out to all their donors, mm -hmm. and so I mean that's you know significant. Okay, Robert. Just just um, the. Um, Rec, old rec building is usually known across street has the exact same storm windows and they do remove a certain number of them in the summer so they can have ventilation and put in window air conditioners so it is possible to take them on up if there's a need to have ventilation for some reason and the other thing is if the windows get to the point where they do function you can still leave the glass on the outside and simply move the interior window up or down. Hmm. So mm -hmm. there will be a rolling circulation. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's the pleasure of the board? For what? For well, what? we were talking about combining these. I think we can deliberate at some point. I think tonight well, we're just still. Well, we have no, to, we have to give them, them an idea of. Well, they're going to prepare something. If they're going to give they us said. numbers, then we can look at the numbers that they come back with and, and talk about it at another meeting, I would think. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. They may find there's no cost savings. Right. Sorry. Okay. The, I don't think, I mean, I thought we determined that we're not doing it for cost savings since if they go under, we get that money back. But it's more about getting one article passed at town meeting rather than trying to get two articles passed at town meeting. So. I, I think, you know, and that we would like to see, right. I, I think it would be good to see one, see it all as one project, mm -hmm. whether the numbers are the same right now or not. Whoever takes that project on, on town meeting floor, whoever's gonna represent the group better be able to articulate a real good position to town meeting because there's a couple of members of town meeting and we all know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the history on this is that this committee asked some tough questions. The finance committee asked some tough questions. So far, <laughs> town meeting has not. I don't expect to always have that luxury, but I'm just commenting on what we've experienced so far. Okay, anything else from the board, John? Just one final question. You've stated pretty clearly that from a project management point of view and probably a cost point of view, you prefer to have this as a combined project. But from the point of view of what was just being discussed, that is town meeting, would you prefer the risk of having two projects presented to town meeting where you might only get one approved or the risk of a more expensive single project presented to town okay. meeting? Um, I, I've been around town government for over 10 years now in Harwich. And I think the town as a whole is more of the mindset of the opinion that Mary voiced. I think that the real issue is, I know I added up the number of projects that have come before you this year. So I know you've got a lot of things to look at. So if this committee is comfortable with us giving you one project and voting on that, that I think is the biggest hurdle. I think that I'm much less worried about town meeting itself because I think there are a couple of people who are gonna complain about this and I think the large, large majority of people in this town are gonna support it. Whether I bring in a $250,000 project or a 450 or a 700. Thank you. I could be wrong, but that's what I see. I like that confidence. Mary. I'd also say that we can plan for a contingency if, if this board chose and wanted to see at least we could go forward with a, um, a combined project and if it didn't look like that was meeting with town meeting approval, as long as we had planned for a contingency, this board could always report out a contingency on the same. So I think it we can do the background work to make it happen if 
we wanted to do salvage one versus both. Right. Can always offer an amendment. Can always change. I just want to mm -hmm. clarify because there's been a lot of discussion here. We're we're not making a decision about one no. or two. No. We're no. just no. asking for information yeah. to inform further mm -hmm. discussion. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And may I ask, when do you meet again? Um, it's a busy time of year for. We haven't discussed that, but we're. Well, we'd be the second Thursday in January. <laughs> the calendar has not been arranged yet, but that. Is the plan to now be the thirteenth of January? Well we will have okay. we will have a single application to you, whether or not it includes any cost reduction. Um, but we will have a single application to you in advance of that meeting. Okay, fair enough. Um Kelly. She's <laughs> over there somewhere. She's trying. <laughs> Good job. Kelly, go ahead. Um, I have a question about the windows. Am I okay to proceed That's off this topic? Okay. So a, a question that I've had for a while until we got on this topic, um, uh, I was involved in a, a windows project a few years ago, and I'm curious with the glazing, did you do analysis to determine what that's composed of already, or are you guessing that it has lead in it? And the reason I'm asking is because we found asbestos that we had to deal with in the glazing that we dealt with. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, we, no, we have not done the testing on this as yet. Um, I think it probably would make sense since we actually seem to have some time for the next application to have it tested. Um, I mentioned lead is likely to be in this. Mm -hmm. We tend to see asbestos coming in with glazing compounds from the 1890s on. Um, I don't know if that's consistent with your experience with those windows. Um, so I think that that would make sense to test this. Regardless, it, the practices are pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was questioning just in terms of in case that would affect cost if you found yeah. asbestos. Thank you. Okay. All set. You are. Okay. Anything else from the board? You have your marching orders. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Very much, Thank you. so much. That was a lovely presentation. Yes. Next meeting is the 12th, I think, not yeah. the 14th. I think the 14th. I don't yeah. they didn't have a calendar. That's yeah, right. I don't have a calendar. I just want to oh, clarify. My plan That's is to book. Four and seven, yeah. 11. It's the 12th. Yeah, which is the 12th. It is the 12th. You're right. You're okay. correct. And that's going into um, Monday's a holiday. Monday following that. Previous or the following? The following. Martin Luther King. Okay. Martin Luther King, the 16th. Okay. Here, where are we? Bell's neck. Um, Bell's Neck, um, that project is going to be on hold. David's not available. Michael. Michael's not available tonight. And we'll do that at our next meeting. So um, we had the discussion with Eric. Meeting agenda points. Anybody want anything on the agenda? Well, we got those two. Robert. Um, will that meeting, besides hearing about uh, from Michael Lott, um, will we start deliberating that meeting? We'll start deliberating that meeting. Okay. Elizabeth. Um. And, and uh, before I, Elizabeth, I want to apologize to the board. I had asked the board in previous years not to show enthusiasm right. about any one of the, and I know you were going to call me, and I am guilty of doing exactly that. So, that being said, Elizabeth, you have the floor. <laughs> See, you're human too, everybody. Is. Um, I'm just wondering if you've had any further information about whether we're going to actually have an idea of how much money we're going to have to spend by the next meeting. 
Um, I can't answer that question. I wish I could. No, that's, that is an answer. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> Those of you that have been on this board for a while, pretty well estimate how much money we have. I won't make a plug, I, I cannot make a public estimation of that money because I'm a volunteer. That information has to come from the finance director. Given that, um, John, you're going to try to bail me out of this? <laughs> I was just going to ask, can we put that on the agenda, even if you don't know whether it actually will happen, as at least a bogey that we can try to hit? Because I don't know yes. where. That's a good idea. Please. Please do. And maybe having it on the agenda might provide a little bit of an incentive for, mm -hmm. for it actually happening. And there is going to be other... There's going to be other forms of communications. Good. So, yes, that's a good idea. Got that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy. Yeah, we should also by then know the state's uh, coalition's latest distribution. Well, did you see the email yeah. that came through? Yeah. So we'll get a little bit more. We we work off <clears throat> the levy. We get 3% of the levy. But we also have monies that are rescinded from time to time. That money goes back into the coffers and there's interest being drawn on those monies, plus the monies themselves. The only caveat to the rescinded money is, and I have a battle with DOI every year over this, except for this year, I'm not gonna get involved. The money has already gone through free cash. It's already been certified. It's been certified when they close the books. I know she's going to drive me. She's going to <laughs> shoot me. It, it, the money has been certified when the town closed the books. So the money comes to CPC. We have applications. We distribute that money. That some of that money is not used. So it comes back to CPC. Up until two, maybe three years ago, we used that money that year. Now DOR has got a directive that it has to go back through the cycle again. It, there's no logic to it whatsoever. It's true. Town meeting has voted that money. The money, the leftover money's come back. So we have to wait another year for the rescinded money from the year that we're working with it. Because it's treated as receipts, just like all other receipts are treated. That's why we have to skip over a year. A humbug. <laughs> just saying. I don't like it either, but it's, it's... But the good news is the stuff we rescinded a year ago, we can now use. We can now use. And that's we eventually not, use That's it. not an estimate either. Exactly. That's great. Okay, again, anything else? For the agenda. Yeah. We have, go ahead, Kathy. Well, are we going to be deliberating or are we going to be voting? I'm at the next meeting. Or is there a possibility of voting? I, I mean, I think we have a lot to deliberate. Deliberation, so. possible vote. Okay. I'll broaden that as far as I can. I always appreciate a deliberation meeting. I do too. Where we don't have to worry about right. the votes. Yeah. <laughs> because, right. No, because only. Be, yeah, come from, from weeds. No, because from a practical standpoint, it lets all of us kind of get a sense of where we all stand, and then we can make some rational judgments on our own where we think where we think we should should spend the money. And that's I know why. that's I know that's how I look at how I approach it every year. So that's why we, we tried. We got rid of the straw vote. Should we look at at a second meeting after that July that January 14th because I mean now we're getting into the yeah, the deliberation stuff. because Mary we know how you love two meetings <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, as I, you I, said I'm last thrilled. week <laughs> I'm thrilled no. yeah. I, after after my November I believe me you you're you're I'm lucky sure, I'm I, sitting I here second that. well I was gonna second that idea too <laughs> partly because 
it's likely we're not going to have money numbers exactly first meeting in January. And so I don't want to vote on things when so maybe the first one you vote on, you're pretty sure you have enough money for. But still, yeah, yeah. if you don't know where the limits are, you know, allocating becomes more of an issue. All right. So if we do the 12th, so the following 19th? That's the MMA conference. I would say the week, the, the 26th would work. Yeah, I'll the 26th. The 26th yeah. would work. The yeah. second would be hard for me. I won't be here on the 26th. I'll be in San uh, Jose. Uh, 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 I, would not I have to give an example. <laughs> and please be patient with me. We had a we had a member of this. We had a director from the town of Howard to come in and make a presentation. Now, there were some very valuable things that were stolen years before from a collection from this area. And the director started to discuss where the valuable things were within this piece of property. And I had a stopper. She thought about it and then got it. The last time I made a presentation to you folks, I said, please don't say to me you're going on vacation. You're just unavailable because those alarm systems that everybody has, <laughs> they can be penetrated very easily. So you don't provide that information in this public forum. You're just unavailable. And if you're going by jet, you're still unavailable. <laughs> exactly. I would, yeah. be, I would be unavailable on the 26th, oh. just FYI. Tuesday? What about, another, what about another day that week? Okay, I've done mine too. The board's got it. There we go. What's that? I could do... I can do Monday. I would be happy to do any day. other day the week of the 26th. Mm -hmm. I might have a, a Tuesday. Might be a planning board, but I would ditch uh, planning board for this. The 24th? Yeah. Just, um, or I could do the, the week of the, I, people said they weren't available the week of the 19th. Um, or we could do this, I could no. do the second week in February. We don't oh. want to go into February, I don't no, think. No, we because of the warrant, we need to, the selectmen are going to need to have some information from us. I've the, already got an email that they want me to do, develop the warrant article. Um, as far as the presentation of the CPC, and I had a laugh. What but about anyway. what about the 17th or 18th? Those are before the MMA conference. Well, the 17th is a holiday. I think. No, that's a, that's, Monday. That's, that's, that's the trust meeting. Oh. The 17th is what a Tuesday. Yeah. But what kind of a trust meeting? Affordable housing trust on Monday? Oh, it's on my schedule. Yeah, it's not going to be open. The 18th, we have a historic meeting. And conservation. Oh. Wednesday? So what yeah, about no, like so the 17th? Everybody's Tuesday, saying the 18th. The 24th. Yeah. The what about the 24th? That's a Tuesday. Yeah. I am available Tuesday the 24th. I am not. Okay. How about the 5th? 5th of January. January. January? Yeah. 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 Have numbers. We'll do it That's the fifth, right. Thursday the fifth, and then Thursday the twelfth. Are you gonna if you don't have not gonna know if you have numbers for the fourteenth? That's all right. Are you gonna have numbers for the fifth? It's that much closer to the the break. I'm just we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. We can have well, we're gonna be just deliberating yeah. anyway, so yeah. we're not gonna be yeah, well, voting. That's fine. Presentation on the fifth, David could do his I mean um, um, Michael well, Michael can do his presentation yeah. on the fifth, maybe Mr. They can, Spitz might have numbers back. You mean that that's awful fast. I know. At the but, but it's a problem. you can send him an email and request. It will. As a request. Mm -hmm. So are we good for the fifth and the twelfth? January fifth and January twelfth. Well, I mean, I could do the 11th and the 12th too. So, so. okay. I Kathy just made a face, but I know you don't think I like I could the, do two the meetings. 11. Yeah, the really 11th. Really, was more about my November than it was about having two meetings. <laughs> We're going to stick with the 5th okay. and the 12th. What day do we have to hand in our votes? What day do we have to have voted by? Whatever the selectmen's deadline is for setting the warrant. 
yeah. whenever they have to sign the warrant, I would think is our is our true drop dead deadline. But all right, so that but, I don't, but David's saying we don't have that much time in February. So hold on. I know we voted in February before because I have done them from places. I have done them from places mm. not within town limits. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the, the attached memo. Okay, so let's see what we got. Not the one this week. Yeah, they're saying December 13th, 20. I think that's departments. I think that's everybody else. 4 p.m. Friday, January 13th. That's the report. That's, right. that, that's, that's not, the report. They've never had to do that, that early. No. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's, that's the reports. The They're trying to get that stuff. This is your report. Right. It doesn't say that's not us for the, no, the warrant. It would be the closure the of the end warrant. Reports. The right. No. That's, that's the end, like the end of the We want to know what the, what the warrant deadline is. I thought it we, was we, don't, we won't know. The warrant deadline. Oh, the we will, because there's a calendar for the for no, the warrant. They they know. <laughs> they know. They, they may know. They know. But we don't they know. They may not follow it, but they know. It's been the, it's been early February for the last few years. So let's just say that it's early February. So we need to be prepared and meet in January. Okay. Right. So we've okay. got those two. And that's meetings. fine. We have two dates in January we can work from. There's one other thing. Um, you have to get to the town administrator or to the town clerk's office. They want a rendering of dates for the use of this facility. Yeah, I know. This one. I mean, you're booking the calendar. Yeah, yeah. and they're real. That in that email this they were all, all uptight about that. So. And it's because people were double booking, and I had already booked for the night. Ooh. And others came in after me. Ooh. Well, they moved finance out of here over to the community center. Oh, well then that won't happen again. So just make sure we get, we have a large contingent. Hmm. Let's make sure we're comfortable in this one. Well, that's my mission, but if I cannot, I will tell you that they, that say the 5th or the 12th is already booked, I'll let you know. Okay, fair enough. Um, Any, anything else? Do I have just a backup just in case? For whatever reason, no. Was there another date? No, find another room. Oh. Got the community center. Oh, the fifth and well, the twelfth. Just 12th. saying, if no, we, no, we're not no. going to not have the meeting just because we can't meet in this room. We can meet in the little room. No, there's mm -hmm. no options. Like we're going to be in this room. <laughs> so moving on. So everybody change their calendar because Dave doesn't want to be in the little room. <laughs> There's no way we're going to meet in that I room. Have to, I have to tell you, we can't Bob say. and I meet in there with Historic, and it's Miserable. it's tight. Yeah. Even with just the five of us at the table and then applicants. We don't want well, we to sit at the table. We can well, spread we around the room. Yeah. Don't get any company. I hear a motion somewhere on this. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second.